I know it's the second to last talk, and it's the last day of the con here, so lunch is settling in. Try to keep you engaged. Um, before I get started, I don't know why more folks don't start with the thank yous. Um, first, I want to thank my wife and my children for letting me stay up past my bedtime to get things like this done. Um, and also the uh, National Area uh, Closure User Group for fielding the first version of this talk. There's a third group of folks I want to thank, and it's a little more relevant to the talk here. And uh, we know the community is full of them, and that is paradigm junkies. Um, I know the word junkie is a negative connotation in general, but um, you know, Closure itself, as we know, has quite the eclectic background, pulling from Rich Hickey's Amazon bookshelf and, and Michael Fogus's, and you know, pulling from things to do and some things not to do from other languages. And we've managed to come up with a pretty practical platform. Right? I think that's part of the reason we're all here. We enjoy paradigm shifts. We enjoy learning brand new things that also get things done. Um, for this particular talk, there are a couple of paradigm junkies we want to thank in particular, and that's these guys. Um, as we know, so yesterday, uh, Dan and Will humbled us with quines, twines, thrines, type inferencers um, from Mini Canron, and David Nolan and community has ported that to closure. Um, the only thing you should infer from these photos is that Dan and Will, you need bigger pictures online that I can pull from. Uh, I looked all I could for both of you, but it didn't happen. So, logic programming. We've seen a couple of talks. Yesterday, as I said, Dan and Will gave us a deep dive. And earlier today, uh, we had a good talk on some of the high-level points in the history behind different parts of logic programming. I want to establish a common vocabulary and a common language and really just center on the parts of CoreLogic that I use for web testing. So if you go to the CoreLogic wiki, you'll see an example much like this, where we're putting down some facts and relationships and querying on it. And I've tweaked it a little bit. So let's walk through this piece by piece so that we're all on the same page for how CoreLogic works. So when we first come to CoreLogic, it's somewhat of a black box, and it kind of should be, even after we know how it works. Um, so it's more important than ever to keep in mind what we're responsible for in our logic program and what the engine is supposed to do for us. So let's step through those. Our first job is to create a language that defines how we're going to relate things. Um, by default, CoreLogic has a few relations built in for lists and other primitive values, but how are we going to talk about the relationships in our application domain? And so we start off with doing that. And we have these def rel forms that provide for us kind of simple named relationships. We're going to talk about men, women, fun people, and people who like people. Um, once we have that vocabulary in place, we can establish the actual relationships that we're going to be dealing with. And so in this case, we're going to hard code some values here uh, that we have some men, women, Mary and Lucy are both fun, nobody else is, and Bob likes Mary, John likes Martha, and Ricky likes Lucy. Once we have both the vocabulary for defining relationships and the actual relationships to work with, the data, uh, we need to do something with that. And that's where the really interesting part of, of logic programming comes in, and that is to establish expectations. And I use the word expectations as kind of our first key, cue over to kind of the testing vocabulary, right? Making assertions, adding constraints. So at the bottom here, this run form is our query. And we've seen this through the other examples that Dan and Will gave. I'm going to pull it up to the middle so folks in the back can see it better. So this is the really important part. I'm going to just walk through this piece by piece. We start with the run form. Now, run is our entry point into logic world, outside of which we get to be in closure, inside of which we play it by CoreLogic's rules. Um, we have a star on the end, tells the logic engine to give us every possible answer, every possible scenario that makes our assertions true. Next in line is the queue, and this is kind of a convention for um, having our escape hatch. This is our exit point from the logic world. Whatever happens to get bound to Q, which is a fresh logic variable, it has no particular value at the beginning. Whatever we happen to unify with Q or bind to Q in the process of our program is the final return value of the whole run form. So that's how we get real values out of, out of logic world back into closure world. So going next in line here, we're going to set up some nicely named fresh logic variables. In, the, in this case, we don't need to have an extra one, but it's nice to have one that makes sense for the domain we're testing. So we're going to create a, a new fresh variable person. Then we're going to ask things about that person. So first, there's two assertions I want to make. Uh, is, this person, is the person fun, and is the person liked by Ricky? And uh, because these phrases are side by side and there's no other control structures, these are conjunctive, such as an and relationship. Both must be true for the whole run to succeed. Finally, if those two things are going to hold, we can take the, the person that was found by that logic run and bind it to Q, and again, that becomes the return value of the entire run form back to our regular functional programming space. And the only person who satisfies all those constraints in this way is Lucy. And we'll notice here important is that it's actually a you know, sequence because we have zero, one, or more than one answers. So Lucy is the single answer in this case. So we've all done all that work. We had to set up relationships. We had to actually you know, define the language for them, instantiate them, and now we, you know, we had to run a query over them. What is the logic engine going to give us for free? Um, first and most simply, and there's a lot more it does than this, but this, these are the things I want to focus on for our testing purposes. Uh, I should be able to verify facts that we've encoded in our, in our little mini database of people. 
So here we have is loosely fun. And Q, as we said, is the return value, but it gets bound to nothing in this case. So it returns, we get the output of a fresh logic variable, all the underscore dot numbers. We saw that yesterday with the quines, just pages and pages of underscore dot number. Um, so here we have, yes, Lucy is fun, but no, Martha, Martha's no fun. Um, so verification of facts. And secondly, and possibly more interesting, is that it should be able to follow implications. And sometimes people call this making, you know, making inferences, that, that word inference is kind of loaded. Um, but it should be able to follow the implications of the relationships that we established in our application. So in this case, it should be able to work through the fact that the same person is both fun and liked by Ricky. So let's take a grossly oversimplified you know, uh, view of this. Um, we know that none of these guys are fun or liked by Ricky, so we're going to start with the right answer and work our way through. Under the covers, core logic keeps you know, what's called a substitution map that associates the fresh variables along the way with actual values and sees if everything works out in the end. We're going to do it highly simplistically by replacing the word person with the person we're trying. So, Lucy is the candidate. Is she fun? Yes, she is. Uh, is she liked by Ricky? Yes, she is. And so finally, since she passed through both those phases, Q, having been bound to nothing else as part of this run, is still fresh, that's still available to be bound to, unified with, and so Lucy comes out as the only answer to this puzzle. So, given all of those behaviors, given all that kind of characteristics of logic programming, just a priori, what would incline us to think that logic programming is even suited for testing? Why would it make an interesting part of our testing toolkit? And I think there are a few areas that come to mind, at least for me. So, the first thing we said about the logic engine was its, its responsibility is to do some verification of facts in our application domain. And we use the word verify, well, it's part of what we're doing with our testing, is we're trying to verify that values are a certain, a certain value in a certain context. And the question we're going to ask ourselves is, are we already doing some modicum of testing by having a relational paradigm as part of our coding? So simple examples to look at uh, cons. Now, I know it's closure. Where's the conj? I'm sorry. So let's take cons. If I cons A onto BCD, I get ABCD. Nothing surprising there. How do we transform this from a regular function to a relational function to a goal? Well, Dan and Will told us yesterday there's two steps. First step. Add an O to the end, right? That's the most important step. And as Craig Andera said, if you use a logic program, you should you pull in, you should alias the logic portion as L. So you can say L Conzo, L Texto, L Membro. <laughs> it's not entirely culturally sensitive, but it'll, it'll be good for good reading. So uh, here we have Conzo. We've done two things. We've added the O, so it's just a convention, so we can keep saying, uh, looking between regular functions and relational functions. But we've also tacked on one extra parameter here. And as was mentioned yesterday, uh, what cons would return as output, we're going to tack on as the last argument of this relation. And the whole idea is that we're, we're talking about a relationship between two inputs and an output for the idea of consing. Um, so here we have built in that if I run this, so we have Q, which is the fresh variable, consing A onto B, C, D, Q should be bound to the only possible answer to this. And we get back a list of answers with a single answer of the list A, B, C, D. So if we were to hard code that, we could get verification that this behavior is true. So you know, we're already doing, so if we were testing cons ourselves, like we were writing our own list and testing our own cons, we would check that this operation gives that output. So there's kind of a meta question I just want us to keep in mind as we work through this is, what, you know, if we're already doing some testing, then what's that next level of testing we're going to uh, think about and get into? Going beyond that, there's some uh, kind of relatively smaller wins that we get. Um, as we've seen from all the programs here, uh, there, in, both in this example and from Dan and Will, um, logic program has a declarative syntax. And that gives us a win when we're trying to encode complex conditions and complex flows that we have a declarative syntax at hand to kind of work through those a little more cleanly. Um, perhaps a subtler point, and when we have our own applications and we're doing high-level testing, so this is where really the focus of this talk is web testing, which is high-level, we're testing a lot of different conditions at once. I might step through my application three steps, and I want to stop, and I want to see you know, five different conditions are true, ten different conditions are true. And uh, if we're not, you know, and by default, when we encode those ourselves with ifs, else's, cons, um, we're, we're adding kind of a sequentialness to our testing. We work through each one in part, and we kind of map out the branches ourselves. But um, as was mentioned before, uh, parts of mini Canron, is that, is that better? I kind of like that. Um, can parts of our program be ordered arbitrarily? And for certain things they can't be, but for certain simple things they can be. So for our original example, it shouldn't matter whether or not you know, we checked that she was fun, Lucy was fun first or that Ricky liked her, or even if we just bound two fresh variables together and made them you know, associated in that substitutions map, it shouldn't matter because by the end, all the associations will come to make you know, the, the right answer. Um, and then finally, and this is kind of a more, this is the point that kind of spans beyond testing. Um, is testing exploration. So at least for myself, when working with separate QA teams, one of the things that QA guys do a lot better than I do is taking my application and finding different ways to get to the same answer. 
um, kind of taking different navigational paths through an application or exploring different workflows, which often exposes brittleness and edge cases that I didn't consider. And so there's no reason why our testing tools can't also kind of open the door to a little bit more exploration, especially while we're authoring our tests. And so I just want to take you know, the example we looked at. Um, here we're looking at a query that's really a combination of a statement and a question. And the statement is about Ricky and who he likes. And the question is about this fun person who is also liked by Ricky. Um, what would it take for us to transform this program from a kind of this half statement, half question to a full open-ended open question? Well, we just replace the hard-coded value with one extra fresh variable and we're done. Nothing else structurally changes. So here we have person one and person two as opposed to person. And we find that, lo and behold, Lucy isn't the only fun person liked by somebody else. There's also Bob and Mary. Um, so this is a simple example of transforming hard-coded values, statements, and making them questions. And we're going to find as we kind of explore using logic programs for things that maybe they weren't originally intended for, that as we dial the knob between making statements and asking questions, a lot of power comes out of that. So um, this goes beyond testing, though. I don't need to just use this for testing. Um, this is showing us we had a custom domain. We defined our own vocabulary for relationships. And now we have this kind of custom query language for talking about fun people and people who like people. And so I don't think this is a great revelation for those who are to do a lot of logic programming, but if you've come to CoreLogic and you say, well, you know, why would I even bother? Or you've learned it and say, okay, I can do the zebra puzzle, I can do Sudoku maybe if I'm really good, um, but what do I use this for in kind of my more maybe enterprise or you know, uh, genuinely fully practical application? And that is that CoreLogic, among other things, is a query platform. So under the covers, we already have a query language, right, in terms of the, the relations that are, in, are part of CoreLogic itself. But we can also build our own custom query languages using CoreLogic as a platform for that, given the semantics of CoreLogic and under the covers, of course, Mini Canron. This is all it takes to transform what would otherwise seem an unrelated domain into a CoreLogic searchable space. And there's an example of this on the CoreLogic wiki of using Datomic and bringing in uh, Datomic datums into the ecosystem of a logic program. So it's not that hard uh, once you've uh, you know, read people's dissertations and listened to David Nolan's talks multiple times. Even then, it's still kind of magic, right? All right, so we have these characteristics. That, so a priori, we haven't done any coding yet. We kind of think this is going to work out. Maybe there's some things that are going to contribute to the testing story. And that kind of core logic as a, as a, as a query platform seems pretty interesting. So we move forward. But what do we get? We, we talked about paradigm junkies at the beginning. Where is the paradigm shift? I mean, where is that really big, that big win? And I'm going to argue that perhaps with using logic programming in our tests, we're going to get to a higher and possibly correct, in certain circumstances, level of abstraction in our tests. And we're going to be called to test more. And I don't mean that test in terms of number of test cases, but actually the nature of tests and what we choose to test. So that's logic programming, just the crust of mini canon and core logic, but that's all we're going to use for this talk. Um, so web testing, what do I mean by web testing for this particular talk? In the case it wasn't clear, I'm talking about functional testing, I was supposed to load testing. I'm talking about system level, high level, behavioral tests that touch the whole stack as opposed to low level unit tests or integration tests. And the final criterion, so that I can use the libraries that I want to use, is that it should behave like real users when run as much as possible. And with these criteria in place, uh, there's really one open source tool that kind of treats this end to end, and that is Selenium WebDriver. So for those who don't know, Selenium WebDriver is a suite of tools used for automating, programmatically automating graphical browsers. So Firefox, Chrome, IE, Opera, Safari. And as I say, there's a suite of tools. There's things like a Firefox add-on for authoring tests. There's a distributed version for running your tests across multiple computers with different configurations. Our focus here is the simple client APIs that it exposes, especially the Java one. And wrapping the Java is a library called CLJ WebDriver, which consists really of two APIs, kind of a low-level core API that's close to the Java metal, if you will, and then a higher-level taxi, you know, WebDriver, taxi, uh, sorry, API that uh, is a high-level, more terse API for, for getting the same things done. And so the basis of this talk is, is taking those, that same set of functions for manipulating a browser that we'll use for high-level testing in the first place, and combining that with the semantics of core logic, bringing it into the logical realm, um, making our, taking some of those regular functions and adding O's everywhere and turning them into logical, logic functions or, or relations or goals. So we started with this program, and it's somewhat clear how it takes these values and, and might put it into a search tree of some kind and traverse it. We don't really care. That's the whole point. What, what's the, what's the, the corollary for web testing? Well, it's the web page. It's all that we have, right? So how is this going to match up with our, we said we had certain responsibilities as authors of logic programs, and there were certain things the engine gave us. So how's that going to pair up with our other program and, and the web page? So first, what's that language? We're talking about the relationships between values. The, what are the values going to be? Elements on the page, browser, browser specifications. How do we relate those? Well, you get that for free, right? I wrote those. Um, so that's the language. It's a work in progress, of course, and uh, contributions are welcome, but this sort of gives us a base vocabulary for talking about a web page in a relational manner. 
Next, we actually have to have data, right? No good, but we've already done that work, right? We're testing at this point. We have an application that's full of data, right? The web page is chock full of simple things like named attributes, and then the nature of the DOM itself is available to us. We have hierarchies and relationships that are encoded and available to us programmatically from Selenium and its APIs. So there's a host of information there that we can kind of pull from through our testing. All right, and finally, establishing expectations. So what does it look like to write a logic program that uses uh, web, uh, web APIs like CLJ WebDriver? Well, let's start with a couple of ones straight from CLJ WebDriver. I hope these just make natural, you know, intuitive sense. If I ask for the attribute of an element, say the class attribute, I'll get the value of that. If I ask for its tag, I get the tag, text, text, size, width and height, enabled, is it enabled, and then uh, child relationships, you know, does this, is this a child of the second element? So, we said before, what do we do? First step is, tr from transforming this from a regular function to a relational function, what's the first step? Add the O's, okay, that's, and you're done. Um, no, we have to, to add the O's and then we also tack in the return value of the particular function as the last parameter. So now we're talking about, you know, what is the relationship for a particular element, its class attribute, and the value of that class attribute, and going down the list. So, let's move on from this. Okay, that's our part we're writing. What's, the, what's it going to look like when we actually put this to use with the engine? So let's verify a fact about the page. We looked at the GitHub login page before. The home page of GitHub, when you're not logged in, it better have a login link, right? Or otherwise you're not getting in. So. Let's make sure that has a log, has a, an anchor tag that points to that particular URL. So, start with run, have our QSK patch, set up a fresh variable L, that's gonna be our element we're talking about. Does the element have an A tag? Okay, if it does, move on. And then is the href attribute of that anchor tag github.com? So this is kind of a, you know, a simple way to verify is that thing on the page, and lo and behold, it went and found it, and we have the, you know, that logic variable output for Q. Um, that indeed this is on the page. So we have an A tag and it has that particular href. If I were to change the A tag and ask for a block quote with that, we're not gonna find a block quote with that, and we get the empty list for, there are no answers to this particular uh, query. All right, so that was a verification, simple enough. I could have faked that out, right? And it's not live coding. Um, how about following those implications? Um, so let's take a slightly more complex example. We're gonna start here again with Q and have two fresh variables. So I'm interested in finding a child element of another element on the page. So we have L for the child element and parent L for the, for the parent. So the parent is gonna have an ID of header, so we're talking about some header div on the top of the page on GitHub. We're talking, and the, next, the child element itself will have an attribute, a class attribute of top nav, so we're looking for some kind of menu perhaps on the top of the page. And then I wanna verify, is that element in fact the child of its parent? And at the end, I'm only interested in seeing what that child element actually is, so bind that to Q and we'll get the answer. And I think it deserves to stop here and look at what we've done. We've now managed to take a whole domain. That value you see in the bottom commented there is a value from CLJ WebDriver representing an element on the page. It has a UL tag. That's the top list of sign up for, you know, for free, explore, everything else, the top of GitHub. Um, and we can take this value and pipe it right back into CLJ WebDriver. We could click it. We could flash it to see if it's actually there. Um, you know, it's, we've, so we've went from closure into the logic world. We did things according to its terms. We got back real values. Um, so this is extending core logic, and, it, and then, you know, it's, not, it's not rocket science. So let's test an actual app or a keynote app. Right? This is the next stage of web development. So we have a menu, and we have a, an element with an idea of foo inside of that. And I want to test the behavior that I come to this page and I click on foo and it lights up. And under the covers, we're doing that by adding you know, a class of active to that particular element. So a very simple behavior. I hope we can keep it in our minds as we go through the next code examples. We're going to test this twice. We're going to do once just kind of a straightforward CLJ web driver closure tools type of approach. Um, and then we'll try to see what happens if we use it in logic programming and see what, what possible effects that we get. So we're going to start by just finding the element on the page. CLG WebDriver offers us this nice way to just pass in CSS queries and find things, so we're looking for the first LI under that particular UL. I grab that guy, I'm gonna pull out his attribute, and if everything was successful, what should the value of the class attribute be? Active, okay, so we're gonna test for that using the ismacro from closure.test and we test it. is that attribute in fact the string active? Okay, we kind of cheated though, right? Because if I were just to test that I clicked the first and only the first had active, you, you, there's never a situation in a web, web app when like you click on something and multiple events fire by accident or there's like lingering event handlers or objects, and it never happens in, in web development. Um, so no, we needed to be a little more, little more uh, robust here. So let's go ahead and look at all the elements, all the list items. And to do that, we're gonna have to take, go from element to elements and deal with a collection. And so we'll, there's multiple ways to skin this closure collection cat, but we're gonna do it with reduce, and we're just gonna accept that it's the right way at this point. So if I were to work through that list of elements, checking each one, do you have the right class? And if you do, I'm gonna take your ID and toss it in a list, uh, toss it in a vector. 
And uh, at, the end of, at the end, I'll get back you know, the sequence of uh, all the elements that had a class of active. And so if this were successful, according to our current paradigm, we'd get back a sequence with a single item, the string foo, for the element that had the class active. And so we can test that like this. Pretty straightforward. Maybe I want to test a multi-select behavior where I can click multiple things and they're all lit up. And maybe I can make a simpler collection handling here by using filter, for example. So I'll filter on elements that have the class attribute of active. And I can just count them. I'm okay with that. Um, so that was a pretty straightforward, you know, only a couple of functions from the CLJ WebDriver API and some standard closure uh, collection handling and testing. What's it look like when we're using logic programming? Let's just let's kind of explore. Well, first, a pretty straight translation from the functional approach to the logic programming approach here. So let's go grab that first element. We're going to unify him with Q up front, okay? And then we'll just verify that everything we expect is true. So does that element have a class attribute that is active? Now, if this comes back as a successful run, if Q returns to the element that we're interested in, then we know we've, we've won. We know that this has been verified. So this is kind of the first example of we've already done some verification. Where is the testing going to come in? Where is the is macro? Um, but we're not quite satisfied. Like before, we're not going to test just the first element. I want to test all the elements. But before we jump into trying to think about closure collection handling here, let's think, what are we trying to encode with this particular line? We're trying to encode them looking for an element that happens to be an LI, and it's under this UL. So there's a relationship there that here I've captured as a CSS query. It's inside a string. Perhaps a more proper place would be as a constraint in my logic program. So this LI thing should be just an element that has a particular tag. It happens to live under this other element, the UL. So, all of a sudden, I now have, uh, because I'm using run star and asking for all the answers, it's going to work through all those elements. So I get the collection handling for free, if you will, due to the semantics of the logic run. So if I take this guy and then we want to test that, say, foo was the only one clicked, I'll just add one more constraint that indeed the ID of the element we're talking about is foo. But as we said before, we're still we're, we're verifying the behavior, but where is the actual test? Um, where is the, the closure dot test is macro? Um, there's a couple ways we could scan this, right? We could, we could Instead of having active and foo hard-coded here, we could add more fresh variables and get them kind of pulled out of the run and look at those values like we did before. You know, is, is, it a, is it a list of a single foo ID? Is it, a, is it three actives? Um, but let's keep it hard-coded. So we said before we're going to explore the difference between you know, making statements and asking open-ended questions. Here we're going to make a big statement. You know, here's all the things that this program should, have, they should be true about. And we're going to test and see if this is true. So if this is true, we said we're going to get back one value. That, that Q should be one element. So, we could test that the run returns a single item in the collection of answers. But that's really not what we're trying to test. We're not trying to test that we got back a data structure with a single element. We're trying to test if this logic run was deterministic, if it had a single answer to the query. And so it's a slightly different semantic. And so we can go ahead and make some helper macros that wrap is and inc include the idea of this is a deterministic relationship that succeeds just one time. Um, so let's go ahead and look at that. So, if we add S, which is a macro available in WebDriver Logic, it says this run should succeed once and only once. Um, and again, it's the same as testing if the collection is a single item, the, an the collection of answers. But the idea is we're testing for a deterministic relationship and it's, it's one, su one success. Maybe I'm testing the multi-select behavior I mentioned before, and I can click multiple things and have them all active at the same time. Well, I can take out the ID is foo constraint and say, okay, it should succeed twice and only twice. Still deterministic, but multiple successes, right? Maybe I want to have some non-determinism in my app. Maybe I'm insane and I want to put randomness. You click on an element and things just start lighting up everywhere. Um, and I don't care if it's, you know, how many it is, it's just to succeed more than once because I've randomized the output. So this is non-deterministic behavior. Um, or maybe I want to encode explicit failure. The S and the U, by the way, are inspired from the reason schema and hash S and hash U as being success and failure, respectively. Um, Notice in these last three slides, I'm going to step back three slides, that the body of my logic program doesn't change. Right? I'm, I have the same semantics here, but I can focus on what is the nature of the success of this logic run. And it's somewhat of a nuanced point, but it's, you know, it, it, uh, I think it's a, a, a different way to look at it. And it's interesting that we can enca encapsulate all the relationships that we're interested in, in the logic program, in the relational paradigm we're already working in, and then focus on the success. Is this enough? No, it's not enough. We have to eventually pull out the actual values we're testing sometimes and make sure that, for example, foo is the only one. But once we're thinking about this in terms of the nature of the success of the logic run, we can work with it differently. Right? When I'm not thinking about doing collection handling as much as, okay, this should succeed and the answer should be exactly foo. Or maybe there's multiple answers and I clicked on multiple things and so at least in the answers there should be the items foo and bar that were clicked. Um, or maybe 
uh, I can just pass in a random predicate that takes in the answer as the uh, first argument and returns a true or a truthy or a falsy value. And that dictates the nature of success. So I, I, the combination of things here, the focus is we're at a higher level of abstraction when we start putting all of our eggs in the logic program, or as many as we need to, and then, uh, and then thinking of CoreLogic as more than just you know, a, a tool for solving the zebra puzzle, but also as really uh, a platform for writing queries uh, focused on our own applications. So is it all fun and games? No, it's not. This is one of the few times you can actually use Keynote's built-in graphics. It's great. Um, so what are the risks? And the first one's a human factor that I think is just worth mentioning, pink elephant in the room. Um, at least in my experience, um, most QA folk are not um, hardcore Linux kernel hackers or working on the Clojure compiler. If you are, I'm not talking about you. Um, but you know, there's generally a gulf between our QA teams, if they're separate, and developers, and an even wider gulf between those and Clojure developers, and there's an abyss between those uh, and doing you know, logic programming and closure development, right? There's a big gap there. We're not talking about this. We're talking about teams that are, you know, uh, companies that keep developers as their QA and simply switch up teams to test each other's code, or companies that have QA with paired engineers. So this is a human problem, a half problem, but I think just mention the obvious here. Cover of Duh magazine. All right, performance. This is the really interesting one, right? I, you know, does this actually perform? You know, as the famous as Alan Perlis quote that lists Programmers know the value of everything but the cost of nothing. And I think Rich Higgy has a version of that. Um, let's be honest, there's performance issues up front before we think through the problem. Um, so when you're using CLJ WebDriver or really any conscientious closure uh, API, you get laziness by default, right? If you ask for 2,000 elements off the page, you're not going to get them unless you ask for all of them explicitly. You get back a lazy seek of all the elements that match your particular query, for example. But when we're using the logic engine, it's going to search the page for us. If you don't give enough information, it's got to go find it, right? It's got to search the whole DOM. That's an expensive operation to traverse all of that, um, especially in Selenium WebDriver. So we have to think about the generality of our queries that we're passing in. Then don't ask for every anchor tag if you don't need every anchor tag. Um, we don't have any more laziness, and of course the page size, but it doesn't take a very big page for this to get expensive in Selenium WebDriver. So what's the solution to this particular problem? How can we you know, not incur this cost of searching this large space um, with possibly expensive API calls? Well, the solution that I've added in is poor man's constraints. Now, I say it's poor man's because I haven't read the papers that David is now reading on constraints. Um, so this is a way to constrain the logic engine to a portion of the page before you ever enter into your run form. So um, we, we, I provide a facility in WebDriver Logic to dynamically rebind how much of the page gets searched for a particular run outside of the run. Um, and this gives us, you know, just tell, gives blinders to the, to the engine. Only look at all the divs, or only the header, or only the content area, or only the anchor tags. Um, and then secondly, kind of two layers of control, both queries that are top-down and queries that are child of relationships. And if you use the library, the, the, the tool makes sense as to why they're both there. That's these guys. So you'll see in early examples on the readme for, this, for the repo that these guys get used early because oftentimes it's expensive to search a large page for things um, or to let the logic engine do the searching for you. The second side of that coin, as I kind of hinted to, is that Selenium WebDriver is a factor of the problem. I don't want to say it's a problem because there's so much uh, excellent work put into the project. Um, but there are architectural factors that make searching the whole DOM via Selenium WebDriver an expensive operation. For those who don't know, under the covers, Selenium WebDriver consists of itself internally of a, of a server and a client. And the server, like for Chrome, boots up Jetty, and it's, it controls the browser via a driver. And your client code that you wrote in Java or the CLJ WebDriver under the covers, you think you're making function calls or method calls. No, no, no. You're sending HTTP requests to this server for everything you do. Um, and this is, a, I mean, obviously a ex more expensive operation than working on some kind of internal closure data structure using regular functions. Um, and because of this, caching is also a relatively small win for Selenium, Selenium WebDriver in, in particular. You can hold on to a reference of the element you're talking about, the actual Java object. But every time you ask for its attribute or do something with it, it's going to be another call over HTTP to that server. Um, so there, it's, a, it's a win, but it's a small win, and I'm already doing it in CLJ WebDriver. So to be clear, queries themselves are fast. You know, it's, it, the, the CSS queries you provide are parsed quickly, and if you're finding one thing, it's no big deal. It's when you start pulling in all the elements and instantiating them as part of that query that becomes a real issue. So what's the way to solve this? Well, there's no way except to get out of Selenium WebDriver. Um, so uh, I offer a, a secondary namespace in this project called RAW. And all it does is take the page source from Selenium, it says thank you, and tosses it into inLive. And now we have a regular set of closure maps with all the, all the beauty and the performance of that and the inLive selector syntax. And there's a drastic, I mean, unspeakable performance improvement when you use this method. Um, so, so, such a big difference. I have to go back and look as to why CLJ WebDriver has gotten slower. Um, and again, Hugo Duncan, thank you for Criterium. I caught that a couple months ago and it's been great. 
Um, but what do we lose? We lose the whole reason we started with Selenium WebDriver, which is it gives us certain guarantees. And if we haven't thought through the problem, those might not be apparent. But if you, as a tester, are writing this test sequence and you ask to click on an element, and it's there in the DOM, but there's another div that's come over it in time, or it's styled in a way that it's off the page, or there's JavaScript preventing you, then you shouldn't be able to do that. Once we get out of Selenium WebDriver and we're looking at just the DOM structure, we no longer have those assurances that Selenium gives us. So if all you need is to verify the DOM, maybe you don't even need to be using Selenium WebDriver in the first place. But if you have to for authentication purposes or whatever else, you can step out of it for a minute and do things in closure. Um, so is this all we can do? As I mentioned before, we're using just the thin upper crust of CoreLogic and Minicamera. There's, there's almost no, you didn't even see a Condi up there. I can't even do an OR yet, right? Of course you can, but that's not included here. Um, so the first thing is to you know, think through how can we fully leverage the Minicandron feature set and, and, and by extension core logic. There's a lot more there that can go in and thinking about testing in the large and using our logic programs in different ways. Um, we've explored here just a few of the, of the features there. I encourage everyone to go read these things. The Reason Schemer, William Burr's dissertation. I tried, I, I couldn't finish it. And this daunting quotation from Jim Dewey who said at, at Strange Loop that you don't understand Minicandron until you've implemented it yourself. I hope that's not true. Because <laughs> um, I'm not going to get there anytime soon. But um, it's, it's, it's a point well taken. There's a lot of subtlety there. It's not as simple as we might even think just talking about it. Um, so please, go read it. It's fun. Um, so and the last thing I want to show, and good, I have plenty of time here, um, is if we take, we said before, an interesting way to think, to kind of consider using logic programming for um, our tests is to kind of encapsulate all the relational parts of our testing, all the information that's related to each other in the logic program and to test then the nature of the success of that logic run. But if we do that and the whole thing fails, well, what part of that didn't pan out? I had like 10 assertions, which assertion was the one that didn't, didn't work for me? And so this might be a situation, where, this is definitely a situation where we need better uh, you know, granular level reporting. And I think I have a couple of ideas of where this is going to go. It's not there yet, but um, I think it's going to involve some deeper diving into, into Minicandron itself and to core logic. But the last thing I want to show, so every talk on CoreLogic, you know, thank you, Dan and Will, has to have the part where the program goes backwards and forwards. It, why? Um, so I realized this a couple weeks ago, and I was like, mine doesn't go backwards and forwards. And this to a certain extent, right? So if you, we asked to verify, I found a particular element, and I checked its class attribute. Okay, that was, you know, I, I was going forwards, and then I just gave the attributes, and I found an element that satisfied that. That was going backwards, but not quite backwards. What is the quine of web testing with logic programming? I had to find it, so uh, I have a, a work in progress, um, pre-pre-alpha, but when we do arithmetic using closure testing, we do something like this, five does not equal four, and we get this nice output. It tells us it failed, and what you gave it, and what you were supposed to have, right? And it actually evaluated, I mean, there's, there's the five. What on earth would this look like for doing web testing? Okay, so you did something that wasn't the right attribute, maybe it was misspelled, what are you gonna get back from that output? And so I thought through and thought, maybe wouldn't it be great if you're running a test on an application and you know, your test run failed, and it was able to go, okay, I'm gonna show you what you had DOM-wise and what you ought to have had for it to pass. So I can get what you had, we're testing what you already had. How do I generate for you out of logic constraints the DOM needed, that you needed to, to satisfy the constraints you specified in a logic run? So let's look at that. This is the one life coding part, all right. This is what you were encountering, wasn't it? There we go. So. We're gonna think about this in terms of closure data structures, right? So let's create an element that looks somewhat like what we'd see from an, an bigger, please. bigger please. Okay, I did a test earlier. People said it was big enough. All right, let's go here. No worries. Let's, let's see if we get big enough. Yay, nay? More. More. Okie dokie. I was ready for this. Sorry. Yay? All right, there's not very much code. Um, I'll keep that for later. Where are we here? Let's make this the size of my screen here. Uh-oh. All right. So, let's define a tag that looks like what we'd see if we're working with in live, it's a map form. Uh, it has a tag, it has some content, and it has adders, and we're gonna ignore the fact that adders is a, not a map right now. It's okay, implementation specific. This is, the, this is the quine of web testing, right? So if I have that guy, I can then do the things we're doing all, all, all along. So I'm gonna ask things about that data structure. Get attribute O. And so I'll keep that guy in there, so we're gonna verify things about him. Is his class active? And we should get back, 
I can't see the output. That's good. Yes, it is. All right. Uh, if we were to take out some of these values and ask questions about them, so uh, let's, let's keep class and let's ask what is, act, what is the value of that particular attribute. We're going to see active. Okay, that still works. And if we go the other way and we ask for, no, oh, don't like it. What is active? Well, the class attribute is active. So if I were to then go one step further and say, okay, we're just take this guy out. I want you to find me the answer. For the purposes of everything else I demonstrated here, We'd go to the web page, we'd, find, we'd let it search the DOM and find an element that had a class attribute that was active. But I'm saying, now we want to generate, we're going to create DOM for you um, on the fly. And so what does that look like? Well, it kind of looks like the data structure we specified above. I only gave you a couple of the things to, to verify that the class was active. I gave you a default tag, and it's a short hop, skip, and a jump to go from something like that to something like that, where you're working on something, you found a div, you thought it had the right thing, Here's what you needed. And the DOM on the right, the markup on the right, was generated on the fly using just the constraints in your logic program. So this is kind of where I see different directions things going. Thank you. The quine of web testing. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like we have five minutes. So any questions? Excuse me. Yes? Um, you mentioned that act has you uh, macros. Yes. Um, what's the reasoning for doing that instead of having a function? Um, simple for me was I was simply wrapping the is macro. I'm sorry, yes, of course. Uh, the question was uh, I introduced a couple of handy macros like s and s plus and s as, et cetera, that are macros. And the question was why weren't they functions? And uh, the reason was that I was looking to simply wrap the is macro. And so I built a macro to then you know, delay the evaluation to things that get past two is. So um, is, as I said before, sorry, is uh, S and its friends add kind of an extra level of testing that you, you had one value, that it was between this range, that it included these items. So it's really just to wrap uh, closure.test is the question. Any other questions? Yes? Sure. So the raw namespace that I mentioned actually works within Live, and in Live works with closure maps. So with, with closure maps, sorry, the question was, uh, can this be extended to, say, JSON formatted data or XML? And the answer is yes, that uh, you know, when we already have tools in the closure community for transforming XML into map structures and to kind of traverse over them, whether it's zippers or other kind of declarative things that have been built. And so we can you know, definitely take those same semantics. And I, I think we've seen some work with uh, maps and CoreLogic here with another presentation. So yes, absolutely. In the back. in the logic program itself, you're saying. Yeah. So the question is, can we, um, the, common, the common idiom of having kind of before and after things happen around test cases and test runs, can we encode that in a logic program? And I'll be honest that I envision uh, this part being the part where you've you're, you're kind of done the actions you plan to do and you're stopping in that kind of state snapshot of your application and testing a complex condition. Um, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing to consider. And I think part of the work that needs to be done with, with the idea is to build it out more into the large and see what does it look like to incorporate the random core logic test run in your, in your test suite. And maybe there's a place to include, um, to include things like that to make it explicit what's happening before and after a particular logic run. So that's a good question. Definitely open for further work. Any other questions? Great, thank you.